want to welcome all of you to Purpose Church. If you're watching online right now in this moment, we're so glad that you're tuning in with us. And if you're here in the worship center, thank you so much for being with us here today. I want to have a really honest conversation with us about what it means to be God's people and what it means to be in God's house. In other words, when we gather, and whether we're gathering here in the worship center or we're gathering in our living rooms at home, when we gather and then when we scatter, what does it mean to be God's people? What does it mean to be God's house? And let me just remind us all of the cultural moment that we find ourselves in. We, we are facing the big four right now. Number one, we are in the middle of a pandemic. Number two, we are in a recession. Number three, there is racial tension in our country. And number four, this is an election year. Can I just tell you, movies are going to be written starring your favorite actors and actresses about 2020. I mean, this is a crazy moment in history that every single one of us find ourselves in. But this is not the first time that the people of God have had to learn how to navigate themselves, how to be God's people in God's house in a difficult season. The, the, the letter we're studying all summer is First Peter. It was written by Peter, the disciple of Jesus, and he was writing to a diverse community. He, he was writing to a group of people who didn't see the world the same way, right? He, he was writing to Jews and Gentiles. He was writing to the young, and he was writing to, to the wise, right? He was writing to the new believers, and he was writing to the seasoned saints among them. And in the midst of this diversity and in the middle of persecution, the church, the first church, stood out. The people of God, God's house, they had a forever lasting impact on the world. And so how do we do that? Well, to begin, we need to understand that we as a church, we are a multi-church. And what I mean by that is this. We are a multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-political, and multi-opinionated church. And that's a beautiful thing if. Hang with me for a second. That's a beautiful thing if we unify around Jesus. God's house could show the world a pathway to unity they could only dream of experiencing. In fact, I have this crazy idea in my mind that the world might look back at 2020 and say, the only way we got through it was because of the church, which is why it is so important that we are having this conversation today. And what's powerful is our text just leads us there. The, the passage we're studying today just opens the door wide for every single one of us to have open hearts to hear what it is that God desires to say to us. And so what I want to talk about for just a few minutes is the five musts that we have got to get, that we have got to rally around as God's people in God's house. So number one, find me in 1 Peter chapter one. Big idea number one is this. God's house must prioritize loving people first. That if we are gonna be God's people, if we're gonna be God's house, we must prioritize loving people first. And let me just say for a moment, if you're here or watching online and you're not sure that you're interested in being a follower of Jesus, I wanna encourage you to tune in because maybe as we explain what God has called us to be, who God has called us to be, it might pique your interest. It might create a desire in you to take a step forward. Or for those of us that are following Jesus, trying to figure out how to do that in this moment, maybe this will sharpen us and focus us. Big idea number one, God's house must prioritize loving people first. First Peter chapter one, beginning in verse 22, it goes like this. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. So piggybacking on what Pastor Glenn was talking about last week, he talked about five motivations for living a holy life. And what Peter is building off of here, by, by the way, Pastor Glenn's sermon was phenomenal last week. If you haven't watched it, he made holiness sound really, really fun, really, really awesome and dynamic. And so I want to encourage you, check that out online, watch it again. On the 
heels of that in light of the holiness that God desires for us to live in, in light of the ways that God has purified us and made us more like himself, we are to love sincerely and we are to love deeply. The word purified here in the original language in the Greek that it was written in, it, 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 in the tense of it has at its core this idea that we have been purified in the past and so there are future implications. Oh, people of God, house of God, may you never forget that as we follow Jesus, as we are changed by him, as we come close to him, there is always a transformation in the way we behave. There's a transformation in the way we live that falling in love with God results in a different kind of life. You see, for, for followers of Jesus, you live by a new operating system. And this new operating system is all about sincere and deep love for others. In the original language, this idea for deep love has at its core a, a consistent kind of love, a fervent kind of love, a persevering kind of love that doesn't give up easily because it is not grounded in and rooted in and resourced by us. It is resourced in God's spirit that is alive in every single one of us. And so it enables us to love people that are very different than us. Well, how do we have that kind of resiliency to sincerely and deeply love when things feel really difficult and we don't fully understand people? How do we have that kind of resiliency? Well, Peter continues he says in verse 23, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. And then Peter makes a profound observation that we need to all remember. He says, For all people are like grass. They and all their glory, all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. God's word lasts forever. This is the word that was preached to you. What he's saying is if we're going to have resiliency, if we're going to truly, sincerely, and deeply love, if we're going to be God's house, we must prioritize loving people first. And the only way we will be able to do that is if we cling to God's enduring word. If God's enduring word becomes the script that we live our lives by. And so friends, I, I may share some things that may be a little hard to hear for some of us, but, but I just feel compelled that we need to talk about this. Number one is this, that we live in a culture we live in a culture right now that it says cancel people. We live in a culture that says cancel people. Jesus says forgive people. The cancel culture is not the kingdom culture. We, we live in a culture that demonizes our enemies. And, and Jesus says you've got to be willing to forgive your enemies. We live in a culture that says politics is the hope of the world. And God's word says Jesus is the hope of the world. These are the things that the people of God, the house of God, must absolutely cling to. Bob Goff, he, he has this, this brilliant quote for us this morning. He says, the way we treat people we disagree with the most is a report card on our faith. Can I ask you, how's your report card right now? Can I be honest with you? I'm in the C minus range. I'm not going to college, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm not doing well. Where are you at? What's the report card of your faith showing if it's based on the way that you are treating and loving people that you disagree with the most? Friends, let me... Let me um, let me theologize this for us for a second. Let me, let, me, let me create a bigger picture for us from the word of God of why this is so important. In, in Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 and 10 it says this. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude. J John's describing heaven here. He says there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from every tribe, from every people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hands. Verse 10, and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Did you notice who is it that gathers around the throne? It is a diverse gathering of people. 
that represent all the nations, that represent all the tribes, that represent all the languages. You see, when you and I walk into eternity, we are not going to all become the same skin color. We are not going to all speak the exact same language. Our diversity glorifies God. It reflects him. It, 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 it's a picture of who he is. This is what heaven will be like. And if that's the case, then let me give you two challenges. First one is this. Diversify your friendships. Diversify your friendships, not because it's cool, not because people are talking about it. Anchor your lives in the word of God. Diversify your friendships because it's heavenly. Because for the 80 short years you're living here, you want to prepare for the eternity that you will have with God. And there will always be diversity in that. So diversify your friendships. Number two, diversify your dinner table. Because you want to prepare for eternity. This means you may need to look outside of your network, outside of the community that you're oftentimes hanging out with. To say, how can I get to know peoples of other tribes and other nations and other ethnicities and other cultures and other backgrounds and other stories? Because that is one of the ways that we prepare for eternity with God and with one another. The gospel calls you and I into uncomfortable conversations. The gospel invites you and I to love the other person in front of us, no matter how unfamiliar their story or experiences might be for us. Because we love Jesus, we want to imitate him. Jesus pursued the Samaritan woman. Jesus pursued the leper. Jesus pursued the centurion. Jesus' life group, his first life group, the disciples were as diverse as you could get. And friends, that was not accidental. Jesus was modeling something very, very important for us. Jesus pursued relationships with people that didn't grow up like him. The gospel compels you and I to do now as Jesus would do. A few weeks ago, I was in a conversation with a black conservative evangelical pastor of a large multi-ethnic church. He shared that a few days before our meeting, he was parked in his car and two police officers pulled up behind him. And even though they weren't stopping him, what happened next surprised him. This black pastor who has law enforcement in his congregation that he loves and supports, he started to have a panic attack in his car. There was a very real fear for him in that moment. I cannot pretend to know what that is like. If you are experiencing distrust of law enforcement, I want to encourage you that a possible step forward for you could be building an authentic friendship with someone in law enforcement. I have had so many conversations with police officers and their spouses, and here's what they're wanting you to hear. They are hurting. They're afraid. They are doing the best they can to fight injustices, and they take seriously their mission to protect and serve. And they feel like they're being targeted when every one of them that I have personally talked to has said they just want to help. To our law enforcement family at Purpose Church, I want you to know that we love you. We see you. We are praying for you. And we are proud that you represent Christ just like all Christians do in the workplace. There's another conversation going on in America right now, and it's a biblical conversation. Racism or prejudice is completely anti-God and needs to be addressed because it breaks God's heart. If you think racism is not real and that it's not a problem and that people of color have basically the same experiences as their white brothers and sisters, I can only beg you to set aside time to build authentic friendships with some people who don't look like you and ask them how racism has played a role in their lives. I'm so grateful to Jesus 
for all of the followers of his that are in our church and that are outside of his church that have been willing to share their stories with me. In those conversations, I have found over and over again that, the mo- that most people of color have personal and systemic experiences with prejudice, bias, and racism. This is not a political conversation. This is a Christian conversation. Reconciliation and justice have always been at the center of God's work in the world, and it's all over the pages of Scripture. It's our job as Christians to see every person as an image bearer of God and to treat them as such. If we're going to do these things, we must anchor ourselves in God's word, in his enduring word. It will only be by his power that we will be able to sincerely and deeply love. Number two, God's house must take an internal inventory. Peter continues in chapter two, verse one, therefore rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. This idea of ridding yourself, it it means to take off, to discard, and to stop consuming. But you can only get rid of something that you are aware of. And so Peter invites you and I to take an internal inventory. But it's not just Peter. It's it's found in Scripture. Look at Psalm 139, verses 23 to 24. says, search me, God. David is saying, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. If there is any, see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. What a beautiful picture of the kind of openness we should have with God. Saying, God, if there's anything in me, that needs to get out of me, would you reveal it to me that I might rid myself of it? I was talking with um, our Celebrate Recovery pastor, Lisa. She, uh, you know, Celebrate Recovery is one of the the coolest things at Purpose Church. It's just such an incredible ministry. And I just want to give a shout out to any of our Celebrate Recovery family. We love you guys. We're so stoked on you. And that ministry is just an incredible place of vulnerability. And one of the things that Pastor Lisa often says in that ministry is we don't just treat the symptoms, we treat the disease. And so a part of Celebrate Recovery is doing internal inventories. And so based on the five uh, things that Peter would say we need to rid ourselves of, I have five questions for you and they go like this. Number one, related to malice, where are there hateful thoughts or evil actions at work in me? We just let that sink in. For those of you watching in your living room right now, maybe you're getting some cereal ready, trying to figure out how to do the things with the kids, just pause for a quick second. Hear this. Where are there hateful thoughts or evil actions at work in me? Number two, deceit. Who am I lying to and taking advantage of? See, the house of God, the people of God, we must be willing to confront our sin and our brokenness, our deceitfulness. Number three, hypocrisy. Why am I pretending to be someone I am not? Why am I pretending to have it all together? Why am I pretending to have all the answers? Why am I pretending to be someone I'm not? Number four, envy. How has jealousy and envy robbed me of enjoying what God has given me? Oh, you guys, this one, for me, it's personal. I just can't help. I don't know if it's the Enneagram 7 in me or what, but I'm constantly seeing what other people have and struggling with envy. And it's ultimately robbing me of what God has given me. And number five, slander. When am I using my words to degrade and dehumanize people made in God's image? And yes, I'm talking about those conversations you have with your spouse. And yes, I'm talking about those conversations that you're having with your life group. And yes, I'm talking about those conversations you're having over a barbecue. I would ask you to think about the words that I'm using. What are they revealing about the way I think about people? Because God's word always calls us to see our enemies as people who God might want to use for his glory. To see people we're giving up on as those that God has never given up on.
Number three, God's house must crave Jesus above all things. If we're gonna be God's people in God's house, whenever we gather and then whenever we scatter, wherever God takes us into all the work environments, the friendships, the places we go, when we gather and then when we scatter as the house of God, as the people of God, we must crave Jesus above all things. Peter continues, he says, like newborn babies, Crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Last week, Pastor Glenn, which by the way, again, last week's message was amazing. And in case you missed it, Pastor Glenn, at one point, he did the pigeon, right? Like he acted, I'm not even gonna try to do it, right? You all saw this. He, he tried to act out like the pigeon, which was just, we need to turn that into a meme. Like we need to do something with that, right? He acts out the pigeon and then he acts out his grandbaby, Felicity. He acts out her being really excited about the eggs. And I didn't know if Glenn was having a heart attack or what was going on, you know what I mean? But he was just going for it. It was absolutely hilarious. But it got me thinking about my own kids, the, the littlest one in our family. His name is Levi, and um, we've got four of them, so we kind of round up on their ages just because it's easier. He's almost two. At some point, he'll be two. Um, but a, a few months ago, many months ago, Levi's obsession was with his baba. This is what he called it, right? Baba. Couldn't say bottle. He said baba. His obsession was with his baba. In fact, Towards the evening when we would prepare it, it didn't matter what else was going on in his life. His singular obsession and focus was his Baba. It's all that he could think of. In fact, everything else was a major distraction in his life. Everything else got in the way. Even if I would try to wrestle with him or play, he would just scream and all of a sudden become like Hulk baby. You know what I mean? Just freaking out to get at his Baba because he craved it because he couldn't get enough of it. I was talking um, with my wife and then a, a few other friends who had been pregnant at, at one point, and I was asking them a little bit about their cravings, and my wife reminded me that for a, a few of our kids, she craved ginger ale and goldfish, like together, like dipping like you would cookies and milk, you know what I mean? Just like goldfish and ginger ale, which just sounds like a disgusting combination. I was talking with another friend of mine who she said that she craved grapefruit and fried ravioli. Just let that settle in for a second. For those of you at home, I guarantee right now, there ain't grapefruit and ravioli in the same place. You know what I mean? You're not doing that right now. That sounds so crazy, but they craved it. It was all that they were thinking about, and they were consuming it. And it reminded me of this truth. You will crave on a regular basis whatever you consume on a regular basis. You will be craving what on a regular basis, whatever it is that you consume on a regular basis. So how do we become God's people in God's house who crave after Jesus? Let me give you a, a spiritual growth roadmap. The spiritual growth roadmap is this. You will crave God when you spend time in God's word with God's people to reach God's world. Let me say that again. You will crave God when you spend time in God's word with God's people to reach God's world. In other words, at Purpose Church, connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God. Connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God. When we are living in that rhythm, when we are spending time in God's word with God's people to reach God's world, we will have a craving because we will be living in the very center of God's will for our lives. What is it right now that you are craving? What is it that you're fixated on? Is it, is it a new Netflix show? Is it the latest news article? What is it that you are craving? And maybe for some of you, you're feeling what I'm feeling, which is like there is so much media going on right now, whether it's what you're watching on TV or online or on Instagram, the posts. And, and I, I read this quote by Pastor Miles McPherson this week that just it, it helped me so much. I wanted to share it with you. He said, here's a better way to approach media consumption. And maybe this isn't for all of you, but maybe, maybe it's for some of you. Ask yourself if what you're watching or listening to helps or hinders your ability to love your neighbor. Does it make you feel justified in your biases or does it foster a sense of compassion in your heart? You see, as the people of God, as the house of God, 
Maybe there's a, a new lens of discernment that you and I need as we are engaging content. Maybe even as we're engaging difficult content, maybe we could begin to pray and say, God, would you build a compassion in me? Would you build a heart within me for these things that I'm reading, the things that I'm seeing that, that naturally would bring about anger and pain and frustration? Would you instead stir inside me compassion? Stir inside me an, an ability to see and to feel about this the way you see and feel about it. But friends, it's also okay to crave Jesus and be sad at the same time. It's okay to crave Jesus and, and be heartbroken. It's okay to crave Jesus and be angry at him and not understanding what he's doing. I'm reading through the book of Psalms right now, and I read this psalm that I'm about to share with you, and honestly, I thought to myself, are we allowed to say that? Like, as followers of God, are we allowed to say these words? Because I feel like I kind of grew up in a church culture where it just felt like these were not okay things to say to God. And yet maybe for some of you, because of where your heart is at right now, maybe you're so wounded, you're so hurting, maybe you're angry at people or maybe you're angry at God. Maybe these acceptable prayers would be helpful for you. In Psalm chapter 10, beginning in verse one, it says this, why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? We're just going to pause there for a second. Any of you feel uncomfortable when you read these words? Maybe you're at home. When you see these, does it feel like, are we allowed to say those kinds of things? Let me remind you this. David is not looking at a friend of his, and he's saying, God's the worst right now. He's not getting a group of people and saying, I'm so angry with God. He is going directly to God. He's going face to face with God. He's literally talking with God and he's saying, why, Lord, are you standoffish? Why is it that I feel like I'm totally alone? And then listen to how the psalm builds. In his arrogance, the wicked man hunts down the weak who are caught in the schemes he devises. He boasts about the cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy and reviles the Lord. Verse 12, arise, Lord. Lift up your hand, O God. Do not forget the helpless pleading with God, going directly to God. Why does, why does the wicked man revile God? Why does he say to himself, he won't call me to account? But you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper. Let's hold this. You are the helper of the fatherless. So in the same prayer that David says, God, it feels like you're nowhere. God, it feels like you're standoffish. God, it feels like I can't see you at all. He also gets this place of remembering what is true about God. And so is God standoffish? Is God far away? No. But that's how he felt. And it was acceptable to say those things to God. And then he remembers that God is the helper of the fatherless. I don't know where that lands for some of you today. But you gotta remember that God is your heavenly father who loves you and adores you. Let's keep going. You, Lord, hear the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them and you listen to their cry. Defending the fatherless and the oppressed so that mere earthly mortals will never again strike terror. God is listening. God is hearing. And God is a defender of the oppressed, of the fatherless, of the wounded, of the hurting. Whatever kind of hurt you're experiencing right now, God knows about it and he loves you and he is with you. Number four, God's house must look like the builder. God's house must look like the builder. Peter continues, as you come to Jesus, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also like living stones are, are, uh, you like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through through Jesus Christ. Why does it matter what you and I crave? Because God is building us into something. And the things we crave will become the things we consume, and the things we consume will become the people that we are. 
And God is building you into a spiritual house. What does that mean? Think about the imagery of a house, of a home as it should be. A a home is a place of refuge. It's a place of safety. It's a place where you're cared, where questions are allowed, where there is stability and where there is support. You see, God is building you into his spiritual house that when we gather, we would love and care for each other. And when we scatter, we would go out into the world as representatives of his spiritual house and we would love and care for and value and lean into and support And point people to the truth of Jesus. There's a devotional I was reading recently. It's it's kind of a men's devotional. If you're looking for a men's devotional, it's called Stand Firm. And and there was an excerpt in there called Under Construction. And this was a quote from the devotional. It said, an average custom home takes about seven months to build. Of that time, just over three weeks is needed to frame the house and put on the roof. The bulk of the time is used on finer carpentry and finishing items. While the outside of the house looks good rather quickly, intricate work that makes the inside of the house structurally sound and livable takes months to complete. You see, becoming like the builder, looking like the builder is going to take time for us as people and as the church But what will we be known for? In in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 to 16, it says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continue to offer God a sacrifice of praise. What does it mean to offer sacrifices to God? It means this, the fruit of the lips that openly profess his name and do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. The house of God, the people of God should be known for proclaiming Jesus above all things. They should be known for doing good and they should be known for sharing resources. This is why when we tithe, when we give of what God has blessed us with, it's a way of us being the church. It's a way of us impacting the world in larger ways than any one of us could do on our own. Verse 6 and 7, for in scripture it says, see I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. Here Peter is saying, Jesus is the cornerstone. I was talking with Chris Chacon, who's a uh, constructor, construction worker, um, contractor, sorry, a contractor in our church. And I was talking with him, and I was asking him about the cornerstone. He said, essentially, it's, it's the foundation. And he just said really clearly, bad foundation means bad construction. Good foundation means good construction. Here, Peter is saying, Jesus is the cornerstone for the Christian. He is the foundation for the Christian. But then Peter also quotes from an Isaiah and a Psalm passage where he talks about that Jesus is the capstone. So he's the the end. He's the last stone to go in. He's the first one to go in. Jesus is the beginning and the end. Jesus is everything. He's core to how we go about being God's people and God's house. He needs to be the beginning and he needs to be your end and everything in between. And our last big idea, number five, God's house must embrace a new identity. God's house must embrace a new identity. Verse nine, Peter says, but you, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter says, guys, You need to remember who you are. You need to embrace this new identity that God has given you. Oh, church, wake up. Wake up and remember who we are. We are a chosen people. This means that God brought us together for a larger purpose. That we are a whole, a royal priesthood. This means that God has given you and I immeasurable value and worth. 
We are a holy nation. This means we are not divided by borders or ethnicities, but we are united in Christ. We are God's special possession. This means that God loves and treasures us and considers us worth it. We are called into the light. This means God will forever be drawing us closer to his heart and we are recipients of mercy. This means God gave up everything to win back his lost people. Oh, church, this is who you are. This is who we are. We are God's people. We are God's house. May you and I choose to live like it. And when we prioritize loving people first, and when we take an internal inventory, and when we crave Jesus above all things, and when we look like the builder, and when we embrace our true and our new identity, we will be God's people. We will be God's house. And the world, the world is waiting and they're watching and they're confused and they're broken and they're hurting and they're wondering, is there any hope? The church is the hope of the world because Jesus is the hope of the world. So may we be God's people. May we be God's house. Heavenly Father, we come to you today needing desperately for you to continue to make us into the kind of people that you've created us to be. God, would Purpose Church continue to be as we've been for 150 years a light to the world, a light to the community. May you continue to reveal in us ways that we need to grow and change that we might become more like you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.